It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the resurgent Robert Begley. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How you doing this afternoon, Robert? I'm doing great, Andy. Ready to be educated privately with today's right. subject. <laughs> right. Get into the classroom with with a non-parel teacher who's just extraordinarily gifted and did amazing things at West Side Preparatory uh, School in, in Chicago. We're talking, of course, about the immortal Marva Collins, whose dates were 1936 yes. to 2015. There she is. You know, the people would say she worked magic and Marva Collins would say, there's no magic to this. It's just a lot <laughs> of hard work and dedicated teaching, right? Well, she's right. And love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She she really gave her students an enormous amount. It was, she filled that classroom with goodwill and you know and, and kindness and and love towards these kids, yes. and they responded to it. Yes, yes, they did. They did. Yeah, I, I mean, so let's those, start off. Yeah, let's go. Uh, Alabama girl, right? Well, you want you want to uh, talk a little bit about her, Jim, her, her, her early her early Crow years? South. Yeah, but uh, born in Jim Crow South in Alabama, Monroeville. And her father, first of all, she had a beautiful childhood. Her father was a businessman, read to her literature, poetry every night, brought her to the store that he owned. She, she did some skills. She would be there when he opened the store, closed it. So she had tasks to do that integrated with her knowledge, uh, with, with her her education and it you know that carried her for the rest of her life um you know from from her childhood so yeah she that's, had a close she had a close relationship with her dad when she was growing up didn't she he sounded like yes, a remarkable dad, guy you know yes, entrepreneur yeah. ran a grocery store did well was educated loved books and like you said read to his his daughter when she was young that's uh you know that's that's really good parenting it's good stuff yeah Good stuff, and her her mother too. Not not uh, disregarding that. Uh, one time, her mother she asks her mother, "Can I go to my friend's house and play?" And the mother says, "Why don't you read a book instead? Because that'll prepare you more for the world." And then within like two weeks, Marva Collins has like a whole library full of books, and she says, "My parents didn't know what they unleashed <laughs> by getting me involved in books." So her mom gets yeah, credit well, uh, there too. But her, imagine her future that. students, yeah, her future students <laughs> didn't know that you know, Mr. and Mrs. Collins, your creator was was that was that her family name or was that her ma her married name? Yes. So um, her, I don't, I, oh, don't, I, don't, a, I don't I don't no, I don't even, I don't even know. No, no, you don't know. She uh, that is a married name. So that's a good point. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I don't know what um, her family name. A family name was. Need to do I. That's. <laughs> I, I should have brought that uh, data with me, but uh, well, anyway, you know, everybody, everybody out there, everybody out there at Hero Land, we did, Robert and I didn't do our homework adequately, all right? So we apologize, but this part. is the information age. Yeah, we did the. This is the information age, so you can Google that readily and find out what Marva Collins' family name was. But more to the point, of course, is what her, rather than her name was the extraordinary teaching that she went on to do. So right, that's right. So that's right. She went. That's, she she went. Right. To, she went. To, Went to secretarial school herself, didn't she? She went to secretarial school in Atlanta, uh, got a degree, but guess what? In the South, a, secretary, a black secretary really couldn't find the job either. So by right. default, because she liked teaching, uh, she had a good experience in learning, and she just went into teaching because she uh, just had a real interest in that, and then ended up getting a job teaching then um so that that was she graduated i think like 1956 from college and then she moved up to chicago because yeah, guess we should, what we should we should she we should point out we should point out 1956 in alabama that's still you know that george wallace is yes. uh, about to become governor shortly after right? in, in birmingham yes. they love the governor that's but true. we all did what we could do let us talking about what, George Wallace, right? And, sweet and home, about George, sweet home yes. for some people, not for everyone. Not <laughs> for black sure. Americans, not in the 1950s. Not as, now. In, in fairness to Alabama, we have to point out today. You know, the the South has changed. Uh, you know, an enormous amount generally. Although I hear there are still pockets, you know, of real 
uh, racism. But generally, the South has changed enormously. I saw firsthand my year at Clemson in South Carolina, cradle of the Confederacy. Yeah. Uh, how how, how much right. how much better how much better uh, it, it is for for Black Americans in the in the South today. But in the nineteen fifties, Jim Crow was still brutally oppressive. And can you can imagine that somebody with Marvin Collins skills and ability couldn't be hired as a secretary for a business because of her skin color. I mean, that is so irrational, but yeah. yep. you know, obstacles are Absolutely. just things to overcome, right? Shackleton said <laughs> Marva Collins overcame a few. So you say she moved to Chicago. You, 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 That's you right. Say, so she moves to Chicago and she marries and she has three kids. And then she realizes she misses teaching. Now, one of the great things about her choices in life, and she is so big on free will and choice, yeah, yeah. is because she didn't follow the teacher's college route, the way to get a degree in teaching, she had her own methodology. And this helped her. She couldn't get, I think she was like a substitute or part-time teacher in and out of government schools. We don't call them public schools anymore. They're actually government schools. That's kind of more descriptive of what they are. For 14 years, she in Chicago. And over that span, it becomes a slum area where, where she is. And uh, it's so this is all from the si early 60s to the mid 70s. She's mm -hmm. going through uh, the change and trying to improve. And she's met with low standards, keep quiet, collect your paycheck. We know what is right. And she's frustrated with this and fed up with this whole experience. So she wants to take a next step here. Yeah. And a lot of the teachers, you know, and, and professional educators in the, in the, in these slum neighborhoods, you know, think the kids are ineducable. They, you know, they just, they think that just, these kids just are not fit for an academic education. And, uh, you know, that's those very low expectations, of course, uh, you know, holding the kids back. Let me say something here, because um, I know something about the schools of education. I'm writing, I'm writing a book on, you know, on, on, mm -hmm. on education. Jump in. And, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and it pulls no punches. And I, I name names. And it's not just John Dewey, although he is an arch villain, you know, in this regard. But the teachers' colleges and schools of education, uh, you know, to get a teaching degree, you need to major in education. And, and so the future English teachers are taking fewer English courses than English majors because they're majoring in education. And the future math teachers are, take, are taking fewer math courses than math majors because they're majoring in education. They're taking all these education courses, which are often just useless uh, at best. And so Marva Collins avoided all that by not, you know, not having a, a, a teaching degree. Uh, you realize the, the importance of the academic subjects, uh, you know, and ha had the, you know had the knowledge in those academic sub subjects. And secondly, uh, Marvin Collins recognized systematic phonics is the way to teach reading. The, the right. schools of yeah, the schools of education, the teachers' colleges, they re often generally reject phonics for some variation on the word. The whole word method, look, say, was popular back then. Whole language came into vogue, you know, later. But Marva Collins recognized systematic phonics. I remember, she, I remember reading about her. She used it even when she was teaching math. You read, read a math problems. You know, she has the kids sounding out the words, and they became just expert readers at, at, at West Side Prep, didn't they? Yes, they did. And so let me just backtrack two things. I'm, I'm sorry. Why yeah, did yeah, she go ahead. To, no, that's, yeah. that's fine. Andy. Yeah, go ahead. Why did she move to Chicago? Much as she loved her, her parents, she wanted separation. She wanted to assert her independence. And that's precisely what she did. So, right, marries three kids, works in government schools, gets fed up. So what does she do now? She has, takes out a $5,000 pension and on the second floor of her home that she lives in, they ha that they're renting to tenants, they're out. She wants to build her own school. And here we are. This is going, again, the title, Privatizing <laughs> Education, the Marva Collins Way. So uh, I, got a, I got a lot of quotes. One book, uh, The Marva Collins Way here, is private, low cost, Again, she wanted the rabble rousers from the neighborhood. She wanted the the ones who were uneducable, 
deemed that that right. learning disabled in in government schools she's like i'll prove them wrong okay and andy we have units f from maria montessori same thing and even in literature Doc Stock, as you call him, right? <laughs> Dr. Stockman in Enemy of the People, the last scene. What does he want? He wants all, all the little rascals uh, that he wants to teach them in his school. So this idea of taking kind of the, the worst people to prove out your method uh, just became extremely successful in, um, in her experiment, okay? Yeah, it was really extraordinary. And I think I think we should uh, mention the the movie version of her life, the, the Marva Collins story yes. with uh, Cicely yes. Tyson and, and Cicely Tyson That's and right. Marva Collins and Morgan Freeman. Uh, I, Morgan Freeman was so young in that movie when, when I watched it a couple of days ago. I didn't even recognize him until he spoke. And then I recognized, oh, that's Morgan <laughs> Freeman's voice. <laughs> you, you know? but the voice of God. Morgan yeah, Freeman uh, is yeah. officially the voice of God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or, or something, you know, the voice of dignity and, and you know, and, and, yeah. and reason. Yeah, but, you know um, what I mean. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. I strongly recommend the Marva Collins story to everybody's we great have the link. movie. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, two, great. Two, two great references we, and, and we have that. It's generally we have accurate. It in the, in, yes. Right. It, it is generally accurate, and the other and the other uh, referent that I'm getting a lot of my data from is uh, in the objective standard. My dearest Carrie Ann wrote uh, a piece about Marva Collins. Yeah, I just Marva happened Collins. to have that issue here. I was reading. <laughs> I was reading <laughs> okay. Professor. I was reading Professor Carrie Ann's essay. You know, this morning, <laughs> okay. and yeah, yeah, Carrie Ann Beyond they wrote an excellent uh, essay on. On yeah. Marva Collins in the Objective Standard. What is that? Uh, spring, spring 2019 issue. 2019. Yeah. And yeah. You, can, you can remember oh. Cyrano's the, the one with Cyrano on the cover. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Andy. <laughs> speaking of speaking of great literature, yeah, no, the Professor Carrie Ann's uh, essay on Marva. It's very succinct and essentialized. It's 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 outstanding. So you know, I strongly recommend that. But you know, you, know, you watch the movie and it. Uh, it is it's it's true to real life it, you you just watch it and your jaw drops the way she yes. combines you know real demanding challenging expectations at, of you know acad in, in academic learning with this love for the children the goodwill that just kind of pours out of her it's just it's it's really you know it's too bad we can't clone it, you know, and have millions yeah. of Marva Collins as as, as teachers. Yeah. But I mean, what, what what would any of us have given to have a teacher like Marva Collins when we when we were kids? Oh, incredible, incredible. And so let me just one one um, quick quote from the Marva Collins way. She says, "From the first day of class, Marva was teaching that self respect is the most important thing a person can have." So. Your point, Andy, I, in my life of education, not too many students like put that front and center to me. I had some degree, I, I have to admit, I was not very bright in school, but I had a degree of self-respect. I had what we call in the Bronx street smarts. So, um, but she, she's doing this, she's making a conscious effort at this for her students from the first day in. And what you could see the picture of her. She was always well-groomed. That was a part of her. Yeah, yeah, beautifully uh, dressed. You know, and, to, yeah, to, to, right. to absolutely make sure all the kids looked respectful not for other people. She was not an altruist in, you know, in as what we know, everything was, she says, you don't go to school for your parents. You don't go to school for your friends. You go for yourself because that is your way to success. And of course, what she means by school is her West Side Preparatory uh, School with that, you know, that she opened and ran from the mid seventies and little by little, to, let's talk a little bit about integration because she mixes great works of literature and poetry, and then she has them going into, for instance, um, uh, they learn about the Greek gods, Jupiter, and then they go from there to the solar system and they're reading about the, the planets, Jupiter, and then Carl Sagan and, uh, you know, astronomers. And, and so full integration, you know, the thing that Right. We value and so then, highly you, in right. 
Right. And, you know, you know and Carrie, Carrie, Carrie and Biondi points out in her essay from, from there to the U S space program. And you have this, to the space, you have, yeah. You, yeah, space program. You have this, this, this integration, this integration. What did Margaret Collins say? She wanted, she wanted the kids to see the flow of knowledge and the way it all, yes. the way it all synthesizes and, and comes together yeah. into one, into one package. And yeah, her, her, her kids, you know, just performed. I mean, they, they, the, the main thing, and by the way, I'm surprised that you, the bookworm, you know, weren't, you know, you weren't. Oh man, no, I was not. School. I was not. I tried. I tried, but it, no, it didn't. Well, I could say Eng, English, I was good at and, and writing and, and history, but the other subjects were like just way over my head. I, I was not. Well, yeah. I was the I same was, way in math. Math, I was yeah. the same way in math and foreign languages bored me. And anyway, me you know, I was such a, yeah. I was such a troublemaker in school that they kicked me out of every advanced class, you know, and I was <laughs> no AP classes for you, Bernstein, you know, and then I was, I was right. in these garden variety, right. the future writer, the future writer, I'm in, you know, English 12, not, not, not an honors class. Or anything. <laughs> Be that as it may, <laughs> you know, what people do, we know that here's a life lesson. What people are and do when they're adolescents is not necessarily an indicator as what, what they're going to be and do when they're when they're adults. But, but true, but uh, actually, Andy, if we harken back to the Tolkien episode, I told you oh, I've read a Harkin, lot of my Harkin, Harkin, that's a great word. Only bookworms <laughs> okay. know that word. I'm but sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going in, in the Tolkien episode, I told you I read a lot on my own that was not the required reading. Ayn Rand was not required reading, and Tolkien was not. So I actually liked. I, I loved reading, but yeah, just some some of the subjects I never saw the value, the practical value. So that's why I was I was uh, yeah I not that good a student. I, but again, I didn't have a Marva Collins teacher. <laughs> that's yeah. I think that's a big part of it. If we come back to her and her methodology and pedagogy, um, yeah. So and the, the amazing thing, thing well, the amazing thing, of, most amazing thing about Marva Collins, even more so than the the uh, extraordinary level of academic achievement these supposedly ineducable kids reached even more than that i think is the love of learning she taught them i mean these yes. these kids became lifelong learners because they loved it you remember in the movie one mom takes her son out of school because she says to mom accounts all he wants to do is read and study doesn't want to watch tv doesn't want to go out in the street and play ball you know it's, yeah. it's, you know yep. this is the love of learning that she instilled yeah. in, in in these children it's, it's really that's really yeah. remarkable the other kid, Andy, that was one good example. The other one was the one who broke the window and has wants to be has the airplane models. And she's like, you, there's no way you're ever going to fly a plane if you don't know how to read. And she buys him a little book about, you know, about Planes, airplanes yeah. and pilots right. and things like that. And you just see that evolution. He is like, I think, the concretization of the problem child that she saw her over and over again who went on I just, to do. Yeah, I just saw the movie the other day so it's fresh in my mind she's talking yeah. to the kids on the first day of class you know we're gonna learn this we're gonna learn we're gonna learn that and then the kid you're talking about uh I forget his name off offhand um uh, oh it's Martin his name was Martin but and so mm -hmm. Martin the problem mm -hmm. child says I ain't gonna do none of that <laughs> you know and, and Marvel Carl says I'm not going to do any of that. She says, you know, he's being rebellious. And she's teaching him grammar. You know, You're scene. right. It's, it's it is. Scene. It is. So many great scenes in that movie. We can't, we can't recommend it enough. But coming back to her, uh, here's another one. Uh, Ordinary Children, Extraordinary Teachers, Chapter 11. Here's the title, The Compra Chicos. And she oh, starts okay. by saying, Ayn Rand wrote a very revealing article called The Comprachicos. And then she goes on to quote Rand and then moves on to uh, describing that the normal development of every um, miracle that enters the American classroom is almost a short of failure and mediocrity. The child who questions, queries, and thinks for himself is soon recruited to become part of the herd mentality. Just fill in the blanks, copy from the blackboard, sit quietly and militaristically in rows of orderly seats and develop a robotized mentality and you are a good student. The child who is self-propelled gets his wings clipped. The child who is self-generated uh, gets his motor turned off. What's that reference? Uh, children very yeah, soon yeah. learn to, 
if to go along if they are ever to get along with the teacher. Uh, just finishing this up, the self perpetuate perpetuating hierarchy of the Comparticos works well and society once again becomes deluged with another perennial crop of robotized non-thinkers. Ah, this was in the 70s uh, and 80s that she wrote this and how many, you know, look at any demonstration we see and, those, and do you see robotized non-thinkers, you know, products of government school. This is what she was fighting. So just that itself is, is worth celebrating the heroism in in that uh in recognizing that and fighting that is just no, you know you reminded me yeah you reminded me when was it early 1990s so it's, it's almost almost 30 years ago and Marva Collins was in her prime you know at West Side Prep and it was a old, an old girlfriend of mine I won't mention any names but but she lived in Dallas she taught in the government schools and uh Marva Collins uh came down to speak you know, on, on, on education mm. and brought some of her students with her. And so we'll, 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 we'll call my old girlfriend, you know, Mary, uh, it's not her name. So Mary went and, you know, spoke to Marva Collins and she had some of her 10, some of these 10 year old kids that were her uh, Marva Collins students with her. And, and Mary says, she went and talked to her and, and she talked to the kid telling her about the fountainhead. You know, he read the fountain. Obviously he read the fountainhead. He understood it. Uh, he's 10 years old. Uh, now, you, you know, you know, like we could debate the merits of these very advanced literature for young children, because at one level, they could understand it intellectually, but the romantic, emotional relationships, you know, you know, that go on, it's going to go over the mm -hmm. head of a 10 year old kid who hasn't gone through puberty yet. I understand that criticism, but there, when, when you, when you have the kids read these great stories and they're exciting, the kids could cycle back to them in, in high school when they're 16, 17, 18, after they've gone through puberty and their own, you know, the sexual relationships, the, the romance and everything. Now it has an emotional significance to them as well as, you know, intellectual understanding. And then this 10 year old kid, you know, under, clearly understood the theme of independence in the fountain and clearly understood the, the, the story. Now Marva Collins is probably bringing her best students you know, you, you know, uh, there's probably not a lot of 10 year olds anywhere in the world that really understand the fountainhead like this kid. But nevertheless, Martha Collins' best students were, uh, you know, at this extraordinary level. And, and then the students who weren't, you know, reading and understand the fountainhead at age 10 was still way beyond, you know, the 10 year olds in not only in the government schools, but in most of the most of the top private schools. And Martha Collins students tested over and over and over again, Stanford, Binet, whatever it was, over and over and over again, they tested very, very, very well. So, Andy, that's a fabulous yeah. story I, that I, I didn't, I clearly, we, this is the first time I've heard this, all the years I know you, but what you said struck me in the sense that 10 year old kid reading the fountain dead, yeah, that would, that would give me pause especially if they were doing it on their own, in their own bedroom by themselves. But Marva Collins, she goes with the Socratic method. Why would Howard Rourke do this? What was Gail Winan's motivation for that? You can see her, <laughs> you know, how does this relate to architects? What are the odds of this kid turning out to be an architect? Okay, just because she, so many of her graduates became, you know, engineers and, and professionals uh, across the board. and. So with her as a teacher, oh, that is just, that's fabulous. But I want to piggyback on that. So this is the third book yeah, go ahead. Um, called Values. Highly recommend for families because that, that's, that's basically, um, subtitle is Lighting the Candle of Excellence, a Practical Guide for the Family. And the, and the book is chock full of practical guides. But to what you just said, Andy, reading the Odyssey. I cannot think of a greater work than Homer's Odyssey to teach children patience, determination, stick to itiveness, and the ability to think. The classic epic chronicles the journey of Odysseus after he helped the Greeks uh, de de defeat Troy in the Trojan War. Can you imagine the perspective of a warrior who travels 10 long years to return home? Can you imagine the cleverness of Odysseus? So she just goes on and on setting you up for questions to ask for real life again she was not a compartmental compartmentalizer in the sense that 
this is just something, just good literature. All right. No, it integrates into other aspects of her life. And the other, uh, I know you're going to jump in. The other thing about this book, she wants kids to have a mission statement. <laughs> Imagine that, like a mission statement of life. And she says, if if they don't know how to write it, the parent should write it. But the, the, just the idea of knowing what a mission is, what purpose is, uh, at young ages, four or five years old, it, it's it's just amazing. And when you said the fact right. that I, I just substituted a, a, the Odyssey, as far as what she went yeah, through, what well, she recommended. Absolutely, and and she was very clear. You know, mission statement at early age doesn't doesn't come from Mount Sinai. You know, it, it's not it's not the inalterable yes. word of God. You could you could revise it as you as you get older and learn more and 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 decide that you want to do different things. You know, in, in your life. But the thing that always struck me about. Uh, what a great teacher Marva Collins was. One, one, uh, one of many is the recognition of the, the universality of great literature. You know, yes. uh, it doesn't matter that if Odysseus is a white guy, you know, he, you know, in the year, what, what, when was the Trojan War supposedly? 1200 BC or something, you know, something, yeah, something I think like so, that. yeah, a long, um, long yeah, time so, ago. So, yeah. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, right. Yeah, three thousand <laughs> three thousand years ago, you know, and and we're mostly you know black kids, you know, in in the United States in you know nineteen eighties or nineteen nineties, you know, three thousand years later, you know, and and there was pressure on her from you know the uh, outside sources that you should read stuff that's relevant, right? You know, relevant meaning what what's what are these kids in their neighborhood? What do they see? There's drug gangs and there's teenage pregnancy, and you know, and we should read you know literature that deals with with these kind of problems that are, that are, they see in their everyday life. Now, if it's great literature, I could see you know reading that you could because you could pull you know you could pull the themes out of you know out of a great story. But you, you know, I Marvel Collins recognized that's not necessary. Shakespeare, Homer, they're dealing with universal themes. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter if if, if I'm a black woman and Shakespeare is a white man and I'm living a 20th century American, he's, you know, 16th century English. None of, none of that matters. You, you, we're dealing with, you know, the, the, these timeless themes. Odysseus, and it's an adventure story. You know, it, it, so you know, it draws you in. It's often called the Odyssey, often called the greatest adventure story ever written. And what's it about? Well, Odysseus wants to get home to his wife, who he, Penelope, who he loves, hasn't seen in 10 years at the end of the Trojan War. The son, who she was pregnant when he left, the son he's never met. And it really showed, you know, and what he goes through, fighting monsters and, you know, and gods and the enchanted, the enchantment of goddesses and storms and everything. And he overcomes all that. It really shows the power of family and your know, love and, you know, you know, and, and, and this is a universal theme. This doesn't matter that he's a white dude and, and we have a bunch of you know, black kids in class. And, and Ayn Rand, the fountain, she's writing about independence. That's why I thought, Robert, you remember in the mid nineties, when Oliver Stone of all people was threatening to remake the Fountainhead, yeah. and yeah. it's not the guy I would want to, to remake the Fountainhead. But if they have, back then, if they had done you know a remake of the Fountainhead, the actor I wanted to play Howard Rourke was Denzel Washington because he's such a yes. great actor and had the capacity to project real heroism, real genuine human stature. And this, the Fountainhead's mm -hmm. not about race relations. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what color. You know, the, you know what race the hero is. It's found it's about independence. It's a universal theme, and you can see it's important to human life. And you can see why, why you know, it applies to all of us: black, white, Asian, Latino, male, female, twentieth century. You know, five hundred years from now, it's applicable in, in human life. It's a timeless, universal theme, and Marva Collins recognized that. Taught great literature to the kids who got all the other values, not just the timeless theme, but the great writing of Shakespeare and you know the beautiful use of the language and the characterizations that you could probe deeply into. And she rejected this idea that you know literature or what we read in school has to be immediately about you know what the kids grew up you know with in their neighborhood. It's, that's a very parochial, very localized, a very narrow-minded, myopic. That's the word. It's a very my, that's a very myopic view that Marva Collins just rejected for universe, universality. One of many things that made her such a great teacher. Perfect, Dandy. And to piggyback on that, it's also collectivist in the sense that they wanted her to teach Black history. And she rejected that. 
she completely rejected that as collectivism. She knew individualism and, and what is the smallest minority, the individual. So you go into her class and you are an individual. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm somewhat happy that most of the kids were black in the sense that they had an awesome role model. And I don't, I don't know the ratio of poor whites in that, in that, um, you know, in that neighborhood, but nevertheless, the individualist element came through again, starting with self-respect. All right. If you respect yourself, the collective, whatever group your you, others might associate with you, you reject that because you are an individual and you could have other siblings or, or relatives or people of the same race, color, whatever, uh, who are completely opposite. Uh, from you. And I think that, you know, that was an aspect that she really emphasized the individualism, right. the independence, you know, her right. point here is, come she, back. she said, trust yourself, think for yourself, act for yourself, be yourself. Imitation is suicide. That's, that's one of my favorite, uh, imitation is suicide, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's like, that's like Peter Keating should have, should have heard that, you know, when he was very yes. young. Right, too bad Mrs. Keating didn't didn't tell him tell him that in the Fountainhead. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Howard things, Rock certainly did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Howard Rock told him, <laughs> but by that time he was twenty years old. He needed to hear that when he was two, three, you know, and four. Yes. But be that as it yes. may, uh, yeah, you're right. Marvin Collins again. First of all, the government schools teach very little history of any kind. They don't even call it history anymore. Hundred years ago, they repudiated that for some weird hybrid called social studies, which you know has a little bit of history in it, but not, but not a lot. Marva Collins recognized. No, we teach history. You know, first of all, we teach it, uh, and then we we don't teach white history or black history. You, you know, we teach history, and there are important figures in there. You know, that need to be studied. So in American history, presumably. You know, the kids learned about Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver and all of these, you know, all of these black Americans who did extraordinary things and contributed mightily to to the advancement of, uh, of American culture and, you know, and human civilization more broadly. It's part of history, I mean, regardless of what race, you know, the, these important, important characters are, the, the, regardless of what race the heroes and villains are, uh, you know, uh, she, she taught history. Uh, and um, going back, going back to literature. Professor Carrie Ann Biondi points out in her, her essay how uh, deeply philosophical Marva Collins, you know, Socratic me method often was. And, you know, they read Macbeth when they're like in second grade, <laughs> you know, they're sort of like, you know, very young. And, you know, and, um, and she asked the kids, did the witches make Macbeth? You know, you know, kill the king, yes. you know, and stuff like that. And then they get into like yeah. these seven and eight year old kids are getting into this discussion of free will and yeah. determinism, you know, at a level that they understand. Yeah. The kids will say, no, uh, Macbeth chose to do that. You know, the witches didn't, the witches di didn't control him. You know, the mm -hmm. Macbeth chose to do that. And they're getting into the, into these philosophic discussions that are, that are really deep that you'd, you'd love to see high school students have about Macbeth. Never mind. Seven-year-old kids in second grade. So again, again yeah. it's just extraordinary, you know, Marvin Collins' teaching, teaching methodology, so effective. Yeah. So if we go back to her, her, by her story, so she's running the school with these kids, and she's making a, it's struggling. She would even tell her children if they wanted something, she would bring out the bills a copy of the electric bill and the, and the, this bill. Uh, and she'd say, okay, I know you want a new pair of sneakers, but if we buy you new sneakers, we're not going to have enough money to pay the bill. Do you want to go around without lights? And so concretizing what, what choices make and, uh, or entail. And in, in the film, they, they capture this, that the, her husband is struggling, you know, financially. He they, they're losing the rent from the tenants upstairs. They're not making enough in the quote tuition that they're charging. A lot of it is not. She even says, just pay what you can. That's all. Pay what you can. So uh some journalist hears about her methods and that she has these kids reading Shakespeare at an early age, and he doesn't believe her. So she writes to him, and the next day he shows up 
in the yeah, he said in the Chicago Sun Times he said he yes. said in the Chicago Sun Times major Chicago newspaper that high school students weren't reading Shakespeare didn't know who the bard was right and she wrote to him yes so my students yeah. in elementary school they know who the who the bard is and you're right he didn't believe it so she invited him to come to the school I think it was like the next day he shows he up unannounced up. he shows up unannounced yeah. And sees everything that's going on because you know another thing about her pedagogy is she'd walk up and down the class, you know, the room because there were different levels, and she'd correct punctuation on this guy and she'd give a little, you know, oh good job there, and so she was teaching, <laughs> like in zigzag motion that that again I don't know if that ha how how much that happens anymore, and this journalist comes in and he's he's amazed writes this story now people are sending money to uh to the school and it is expanding uh to some extent so there is a level of success that she is enjoying for a period of time and seeing these children go on um you know as adults and move on in their lives and and this happens for over the course of a couple of decades uh, in in her life, and, and she gets more and more prestige, more speaking opportunities. Now we go into the 1980s. Ronald Reagan, as president, sees what she's doing and wants to nominate her as uh, Secretary of Education, and she would rather wow. be in the classroom. George Herbert Walker Bush yeah, she, wants she, to nominate her. She, and, she respectfully declined. She respectfully that's, declined, that's, but Andy, if we could rewrite history, imagine, <laughs> you know, if we look at the long-term consequences, imagine having someone like her, you know, at the head of these kinds, you know, these kinds of programs back then, it, it's, you know, it was her choice and it's her own happiness. She, she knew her hierarchy right, of values and yeah, yeah this she loved, what, this but, is what she loved, but to she be loved, offered that I is. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's a great honor and richly mm -hmm. deserved. I can, you know, it shows uh, outstanding acumen and judgment on the part of Ronald Reagan to want Marvin Collins as his Secretary of, of Education. Uh, you know, it's, it shows very good insight on his part. But she, she's a classroom person. I mean, this is what she loves. She wants to, she wants to be with the kids, you know, and and have, seeing yep. that light bulb effect. You know, and, and really make it a, yeah. a positive impact in the life of us students. That's what she loves, and we're egoists, and so you know we respect what Marva Collins loved and what she did so superbly. But you know, so she got a lot of uh, recognition, richly deserved. But there were there were mm -hmm. always the naysayers, weren't there? You know, always, the, yeah. what they, yep. hate haters got to hate, as they say. You know, people who who said that she teachers was, she was cheating. Oh yeah, teachers yeah. union. Yeah, one of my mm -hmm. favorite organizations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they were claiming that she, you know, she she juggled the test scores, right? She she interfered. She wasn't this wasn't wasn't it wasn't done honestly, you know, and and so on and 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 so forth. I think there were those kind of criticisms uh, launched investigations from various uh, was it was it was it magazines or newspapers who who investigated yeah. her and found yep. found that those mm -hmm. those charges were baseless that. The, the, that the Marva Collins students actually wrote these essays. She didn't write them. Her students actually scored very, very, very high on these achievement tests on Stanford Binet or or whatever. You know, there was mm -hmm. there, there mm -hmm. was no there was no massaging in the system here, or you know, or, you know, uh, in, inter, intercession or interference with with the with the tests on on her part. This is this is the work that her students legitimately did. Uh, but you know, she made the government schools look bad. She made the teachers union look bad. Uh, even even a number of private schools. Uh, the, these supposedly mm -hmm. ineducable kids were outperforming, yeah. you know, upper middle class, you know, and wealthy, you know, kids yes. from wealthy families in the you know in the suburbs going to not only top government, you know, public high schools in the in the in the suburbs, but going to top private, you know, private schools. Us kids are outperform, outperforming them. I mean, it's, so yeah. uh, I don't know if the naysayers were ever satisfied. I think they say, I think there's a lot of envy going on here, Robert. Uh, you know, Ayn Rand called it the, the age of envy. And that's exactly yes. what, you know, my, for that entire 
experience that she went through, it's the age of envy completely that she's proving. So I actually, let me, let me tell you, Andy, about four or five years ago, Carrie Ann and I did a debate uh, in a Toastmasters club in New York City. And I came up with the idea, public schools should be privatized. And she and I, Carrie Ann and I were the pro and we had two people, uh, not, neither, both foreigners, one from like Jamaica and one from East Europe as the con. And we presented our cases and I took out Marva Collins as, as wait a minute, she, private schools, she took, you, you, you think if they don't have free education, you know, they'll just be, um, you know, bums or criminals on the street, but Marva Collins proved this and this is how she did it. And you can watch this movie and, and et cetera. Turns out we won the debate by like one vote, but the consensus mm -hmm. in the New York audience, which has even grown more is government, good, private, bad. That's, that's all that it was. If the government does it, it's not for profit, selfish reasons, and therefore it's noble. But if a private person, even Marva Collins does it, then it's not, you know, it's, it's, there's some selfish motivation and that's evil and we have to squash it. So that's just a concretization of what us in the sense of trying to do a debate in, in a kind of canned environment, government good, you know, <laughs> private bad. And, and the concrete there, I said, I held up the iPhone. I said, if the, if the government was going to do an iPhone, you know, it'd still be this clunky thing with rotary and <laughs> you know, he'd still be getting well, the, uh, dial tones. And, and so, but just people, you know, on the, on they the, were not persuaded. I know. Well, this is New York City, you also, which is a very left-leaning, uh, you know, in, in yeah. environment. You're, you're right in, in Manhattan, right? Right in the belly of the beast. Yes. But, you know, Yes. Uh, we on on the uh, hero show. We love to quote the great Milton Friedman, who said that you know if we if we put the government in charge of the Sahara in five years, there'd be a shortage of sand. You know, yeah, so, exactly. It's so, it's so true. Yeah, you know, a little bit yeah. of hyperbole there, but <laughs> you know, we get we get Professor Friedman's point. Capitalism produces the good. Socialism, you know, uh, uh, produces poverty. You know, and, and you know, and, and dearth of, of of goods. I'm going back to the the, the private school issue again. But the exact opposite is true. If at some point we can slay the government monolith, uh, it'll make it a lot easier for Marva Collins type to start their own small private schools because they don't have to compete against, you know, the government monster, which, quote, is free. You, you know, you, you don't pay anything. You get free lunch. You get free books, you know, and all, mm -hmm. all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Marva Collins' experience shows us another point. Um, and the movie shows it well, too. There's a lot of people think, well, poor parents don't really value education. They don't. They don't really want their kids to get an education. You know, and tragically, there are some people like that, but they're a very, very, very small by minority of the world population. Overwhelmingly, let's put it this way: mom and dad. There are exceptions, but overwhelmingly, mom and dad love Junior more than the government does. Overwhelmingly, mom and dad wants Junior to do well more than the government does. And overwhelmingly, mom and dad re recognize that an education is important for your little Johnny or, or Judy to do well. And you really see it in the in the movie, in the Marva Collins story, because you see all these parents, poor, poor parents, you know, they, they, they're all told, you know, my, my, my little girl's not learning anything in school, you know, I want my son to come to your school, you, you know, you, you see how, how much they value education. The point being then, that if we can slay the government monolith at some point, parental demand is strong. The demand is strong for education, meaning most parents want education and they can afford to pay something. And they could have will be able to afford to pay more if we kill the property taxes and the income taxes that go to fund the government school. That's going to make it easier for Marva Collins type to start a little school in somebody's basement with five kids, you know, and, and, and do better, uh, do use phonics, use systematic phonics to teach reading, do a lot better than the government schools. So that's the, that's the truth. And Marva Collins story shows us the way. Yeah, Andy. And, Going a slightly uh, sideways on that, what the, what the film dramatizes early on when she wants to open their, her school in her home and the obstacles there, she goes to the government office 
to try to figure out, okay, what what's the process here? And they say, oh, you just fill out these forms. And she's like, no, I'm not, I'm not looking for grants. I'm not looking for government gov money. She basically says, if the government is paying anything, then they're going to tell me what to do. And I right. am not going to have the government tell me what to do. So she sees indoctrination as mm -hmm. the, 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 the uh, connection with go the government gives you the, you know, the freebie, but you're going to have to do it their way. And that's the that's the cycle, right. the vicious cycle. That right. We, right. She it's fought something. Yeah. No. So she, ve bravely. She's very insightful. And yeah. It, but just in in two scenes, just covers that, and she keeps going back over and over again to, uh, you know, to the office there, and they just can't. They're dumbfounded. They're government workers who are like dumbfounded. Wait a minute. You want to start a school, but you accreditation, but you don't really care about government funding. And she's like, No, I, I'm not. Uh, yeah. No, and just yeah, very, similarly, I'll let you jump in a second, Andy. Similarly, welfare, which she just calls updated slavery. She was completely against uh, welfare, and she lived in the area where it was rampant. I got to admit myself, I grew up on welfare. I was, I was embarrassed about it. Whenever I would go to the store, I, I would, with food stamps, I would be scared to death. My my friend Gerard would see me. He worked at the A&P, and, and I would... You know, Gerard, come to the front checkout, and like I would not want to hear that because I'd be there handing food. Stamps. So the the kind of the guilt, like you're not fit for life, that that inculcated in me as a teenager was like it it was it was awful. And Marva Collins saw that, so the self respect that she she put into her students, welfare was not part of that. It was just buying into the system of government giving quote unquote giving you stuff for nothing. But you're now you're indebted to them for the rest of your life. Right. And Marva Collins was very insightful. She understood what your know, professional economists have pointed, you know, free market economists have long pointed out. That is what, what the government finance controls. And this is necessary yes. because the government's yes. gotta make sure that uh, whatever it's financing is operating in a way that meets its standards, such as they are. Yep. <laughs> and, yep. uh, she, and, and she, she said it, you know, in real life and they show it in the movie, the government's not going to yep. tell me what to teach in my classroom. I'm going to, I'm going to yep. decide what's, what's taught in, in my classroom. And you're absolutely right. She warned those kids over and over again about being, about being on welfare, that, that it's, that it's a, it's a trap. You know, and, and that yep. it's we, we want it. We want to develop our minds, have productive careers, make money, be vastly better off financially than we could ever be on welfare. But even more important than that, what, what, to, to what you were talking about, Robert, have the self-esteem of knowing that I am, you know, I, I pull my I pull my own freight in this world. You know, I'm not I'm yep. not I'm not, you know, you know, beholden to the to the government for, for handouts. I have I have. You know, there's a lot of people, black, white, whatever, have too much pride. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll live in poverty sooner than, you know, sooner than take those kind of yeah. handouts. And Marvin Collins pointed out that one, the one, the pride of working, you know, for, you know, for, to make your own money. When we did Andrew Carnegie on this show, you know, remember Andrew Carnegie, well, that was John Hersey and I, uh, mm -hmm. he said that he said the, the, the proudest thing in his life was when he was 12 years old and he got his first paycheck. It was like a, I don't yeah. know. It was like a dollar twenty yeah. a week, or some yeah. very, exactly. very minuscule sure. amount. Yep. Yeah, relative to the hundreds of millions he was worth uh, you know, decades later. But he he worked for it. He earned it. He had that. He had that sense of accomplishment, that sense of pride. So one of the cons instilled that in the in these young in these young children. You, you do financially, mm -hmm. you'll be much better off. More importantly, your self esteem, your level of pride in in yourself as a person is going to be much higher. And she really really taught these kids so many so many uh, lessons one academically but two also this, this is a character issue you know about taking charge of my own life and being mm -hmm. being proud of myself who, mm -hmm. you know who was it who said uh actually i think it was me <laughs> teaching aristotle in class you know on pride that par to put it somewhat paradoxic paradoxically pride is living a life of which you can be proud and uh, you know, mm -hmm. and and, and Marva Collins really, yeah. really taught that to these kids. Yeah, she taught that for sure. And uh, so she continued on uh, with her daughter, uh, 
running the school till around 2008. And that's when they had to close it down because it didn't, it, 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 they were running out of money. Basically they, they had, uh, you know, tried to continue, but too much of the, the uh, juggernaut of government schools, too much opposition, which I attribute, as I said, to the age of envy, whether it is, you know, teachers unions, name, you know, name your opponent. It wasn't an open field where open competition. Uh, I think at one point they estimated she was charging $5,000 tuition, but the gov the taxpayers were paying 11,000 per student in public schools. And so it wasn't economically, you know, feasible. So kept draining, you know, uh, draining the school and she and her daughter had to close it <clears throat> after she was getting you know, old after, she, she was getting decades. old by yes and she, and she was old getting old was, I do, was creeping up on her yeah i do want to backtrack one one popular culture uh reference is prince the the artist oh, yeah. he donated right. five hundred thousand dollars to her uh organization so that she could teach give training. Now, this is a kind of teacher training that should be out there. So she could unleash on the, you know, on the culture, all these uh, future teachers who went through her system. And that was, you know, my <laughs> raise my cap to Prince for recognizing yeah. that. And he even had her in one of his videos, I think most beautiful girl uh, in, in the world. She's like in, in the scene. So again, her, her acclaim was she, she reached a point where she was really well known. I don't, I, I fear that she's not as well known anymore. That's one reason to celebrate her heroism is to revitalize that, that interest in her and continue her legacy. So uh, died yeah, in, and, in and 2015. Her, a method, a method. And her method, to continue yeah. Her, her yeah. Methods. I just want to say something about the sad right. spectacle of West Side Prep closing and the government monolith in Chicago and elsewhere continuing. What kind of education are, are these kids in Chicago getting? We know we know what happens out on the street. You know uh, the the, the, mur the, the, the some of the some of these you know high crime neighborhoods in Chicago. The cops call them Chirac because it's a, you know it's like a it's a combat oh. zone. Yeah, yeah every, it's like every weekend in the summer, but you get to Monday morning, you get the news, you know, 47 people shot in Chicago, you know, 18 mm -hmm. dead over the weekend. <laughs> well, what kind of education are those kids getting? You know, obviously they drop out of school at a, at a, at a, at a very, very early age, not getting much education, you know, at, at all. And you can read the true crime Imagine. literature about this. Yeah, it is. It's heartbreaking. Um, but anyhow, uh, part of the problem is a huge problem network of problems here but part of the problem is that uh many families and, and you know and my family would have been in the, in this category you know can't afford to pay for education twice their property taxes and or you know income taxes sometimes sales taxes go to finance the, the government monolith and then they don't have enough money you know to send their kid to a private school Whereas when we abolish the government schools, we also have to abolish the various levels of taxes that fund them. And then your parents are going to have more money with which to send their kids to, uh, to uh, West, Side, West Side Prep or some, you know, some school like that. So I think, again, I'm, again, I think when we slay the government monolith, it's going to make it easier for superlative educators like Marva Collins to start their own schools, especially when they start small with like four or five kids in their basement, you know, for the, you know, for the first couple yeah. of years and then word of mouth. So look at how these, well, these kids are doing and other parents going to want to, you know, send their kids uh, to, to such schools also. So Mama Khan showed the way. Yeah, to give some she hope. Definitely, she definitely showed the way. Yeah. Yeah. She showed the definitely way and the to way. give some hope towards that end, Andy, you know, homeschooling and pr 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 opposition to government school is higher than any time I've kind of seen in in my lifetime, yeah. in the sense that the failure is so in your face. And just over this past year with Zoom, kids going to school via Zoom and their parents actually seeing what is not being taught and what is, you know, the, the indoctrination. Again, Marvin Collins was about teaching students how to think, not what to think. Right.
and Absolutely. what they're getting today Absolutely. is is what to think. But fortunately, you know, ho hopefully the direction can continue towards this privatization, uh, homeschooling options, and just internet based. Uh, you know, part of the things in in our just uh, coming back to the the. <clears throat> Uh, the debate that we did in Korea, there are teachers who make like a million dollars a year, like they because they have these uh, hordes of students that they do like via internet. And uh, Carrie Ann totally hates teaching via, you know, via Zoom. She is like more, exactly like Marvin Collins. She wants the eye to eye contact in person. But yeah, I just, there are ways to leverage. There are ways to leverage this to reach what you know. Technology can help in that sense of reaching uh, more people if the pedagogy is good. And uh, I see that as a sign of hope uh, going towards the future. Yeah, I mean, if I, I agree with Marva Collins and Carrie Ann Biondi, I think in person is best. But here's, here's, there, are, there are occasions where, you know, Zoom or online is appropriate. I mean, if the choice is somebody gets to watch Leonard Peikoff lecture via Zoom or not have him see him lecture at all, then mm -hmm. let's do it by Zoom because Le Leonard yeah. Peikoff is such a, such a superb lecturer. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yeah, it definitely, definitely has its, has its place. And, you know, to pick up on what you said, uh, homeschooling has, is growing enormously now. And uh, you know, I think in part, you know, because of what, what you, you know, you said that parents, because of the pandemic, see what's going on in their child's classroom now more. And a lot of them are, are properly appalled by the, the very low academic standards, the lack of academic content. Mm -hmm. And more parents are making the choice to homeschool. Our very good friend, Robert, uh, Professor Bradley Thompson, who, uh, you know, Brad Thompson, yeah. Who, 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 yeah, his wife, homeschooled their three children. He's a, you know, he's big on abolishing the government schools and supporting homeschooling yes. initiatives. You yep. know, he's been, been writing about this, how homeschooling uh, has grown uh, exponentially over the last few years. It's grown enormously in the, in the black American community. And let's just yep. hope it continues once the pandemic uh, dies down, because it's not that difficult for parents using systematic phonics to teach their kids how to read, open up the whole world of books and knowledge to their mm -hmm. to their children, mm -hmm. and exceed the the learning that goes on, uh, the, the very limited learning that goes on in the government schools. Not that hard for parents to do a better job, no. you know, and or hire and or hire teachers of you know, or tutors who will teach their children much more than these kids generally learn. In the government school so it's a it's it's good to see that and again you're right we have to let people know what marva collins accomplished because marva collins can light the way for, for people show the way for people who want to homeschool yes. and do a start a small yeah. community school and do a hire tutors or you know uh, teachers private te to privately teach their children is marva collins has shown us what can be done yeah yeah and it's to me i think you know, we find these people, you and John talked about Maria Montessori in, in the past. She was like the 19th century innovator, early 20th century. Marva Collins is just another example. This, it's a, it's a fascinating thing. Like these are mothers who have their own children and, and impart this, first of all, this love, and then this need for self-respect, the importance of self-respect. And, and I just, I, I want to see more of these, you know, I want them to have a greater voice uh, in the future. And, you know, just looking at her, wa watching her movie, reading articles like what Carrie Ann uh, wrote are mm -hmm. the ways towards that end. They, they are some, some of the best ways towards that end. And I'm just hoping that uh, as, as Carrie Ann says, may a thousand Marva Collins bloom. You know, like yes. that's how she ends yeah, the TOS piece. I get it. She can get an amen to that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think we yeah. we could we could sign off. You know, as this one last point uh, for future hero show episode. Uh, there's a there's a British educator writer named James Tooley, who's written about what they call the self organized schools around the mm -hmm. world. It may mm -hmm. be the most well be the most exciting development in education in decades, if not centuries. Okay. That, you know, he went into the nice. poorest countries, 
in, in the poorest parts of India, you know, and uh, various African countries, Uganda, you know, and 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 mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and you go into the slums, and th there are these small private schools that have sprung up spontaneously. They, they, they don't have, like Marvin Collins, they don't, they're not affiliated with the government. And the kids are learning, the kids in these self-organized schools around the world are, are learning, they're testing well on academic tests in, in the poorest areas and the poorest countries in the world. Mm -hmm. It's really extraordinary mm -hmm. how, and how we can replicate that in the United States, yeah. in a you know, with, with vastly more wealth and vastly more resources, you know, small community schools could be the wave of the future in, in reclaiming education from the government monolith. So I think we should yep. have a show on James Tooley and the, the self-organized school because it's Absolutely. very inspiring. And anyone, yeah, anyone who's doing this very kind inspiring. of work, Andy, you and I know education is the biggest problem in the united yeah. oh, states yeah. absolutely which absolutely. the united states runs the world effectively so you fix that and sky's the limit you know flour freedom yes. and flourishing will abound quickly so so yeah let's let's help let's promote anyone who is fighting that battle because that is the greatest battle and right. marva collins certainly yes. did her job <laughs> she certainly oh, did she her sure job did. She did. She did the. She did the work of you know a hundred heroes, and I think we should mm -hmm. salute the great Marva Collins. Yes. Perhaps. Yes. Perhaps the the preeminent educator of the twentieth century, and mm -hmm. as and a, and a mighty he, mighty intellectual hero, and so everyone, yes. Robert, and everyone out there mm -hmm. in Hero Land, I want to wish you have a more heroic day. Have a heroic weekend, lead a more heroic life, and we will see you next week on The Hero Show, everybody. Thank you. Take care.